All right. Good morning. So many of you may recognize this image. It's one of the first images that was taken by humankind from the surface of another planetary body, the moon. When I look at this picture, I think of many things. It evokes many emotions in me, right? I think of how small our planet is. I think of how beautiful it is. I think of what an oasis we have the pleasure to live in, in this huge universe, where not all planets are this welcoming to our species. I think of the limited time that we have on this planet, the limited hours, the limited days, the limited years that each of us has, the limited life that we each have on this planet, and what we do with those hours, how we live, how we work, how we play, what we do with those hours, those limited hours that we have. We've heard a lot today about people wanting to be the change, right? Folks recognizing that they have one life, they have a certain amount of hours in every day, and they want to make sure that what they're doing is enabling their passion and making the world a better place when they leave, trying to be the change. So you heard a little bit about me in the introduction, um, but I'm someone that is generally very, very passionate about how each of us contribute, not just on an individual level, but on a collective level. Right? I talk about my happy place, the things I like to work on, as being at the intersection of public-private partnership, technology policy, and innovation. So for me, a lot of what I get super passionate about is the intersection of public and private sector and individuals working together to create a greater good. I'm passionate about how we partner, how we innovate, and how we work. So many of you are likely familiar with and have seen the work that's been uh, done in the last few years chronicled by Fast Company on Generation Flux, right? This notion of the way we work is changing. So uh, skills are evolving, interests evolve, you can pick up and learn a skill in a, in a few hours on a weekend or in a few semesters uh, through open courseware that you couldn't do 20 years ago as easily. The way people are learning, the industries people are working in, the time that we stay in a certain job, the time that we stay in a certain industry, who we want to work for, if we like big organizations, if we want to work for ourselves, all of that is constantly in flux, right? And so one could say, this is chaos. <laughs> How do I work in this chaos? How do we actually create meaningful work and meaningful contributions to big problems of society when we're in such constant churn, when we're in such constant flux, and there's so much fluidity around us in the way individuals are working, contributing to a broader economy. At NASA, we've been thinking about how you actually channel that chaos, right? And how you work with those individuals and skills that are evolving and growing and here one day and gone the next, and maybe the person that you found a solution from two weeks ago, two years ago, isn't working in that field anymore. They were a physicist one day, and the next day they're working on biochemistry, right? We're trying to figure out how, in fact, we manage, in some ways, this chaos and this fluidity. And most folks don't realize that NASA, for the last 10 years, has actually been really engaged in engaging DIYers, entrepreneurs, citizen innovators, citizen scientists, and doing the real work of space exploration and science. Hearing the talks earlier this morning was so exciting to me to see how many folks were rolling up their sleeves and saying, hey, I can learn how to do this. I want to learn how to do this, and this is what I want to spend my time doing, oftentimes in their free time, right, outside of their regular job. And these are areas that we recognize um, at NASA can be incredible opportunities to get people involved in their space program, and not just for the good of it, right? But actually making a living doing it. So you see an image here with a lot of folks, a lot of young students from the International Space Apps Challenge um, working on problem solving behind their computers. One of the benefits of uh, distributed uh, computers and the internet is that we have access to many more people's brains through that platform, right? Well, um, and many of you have heard of crowdsourcing, and many of you have heard of um, how individuals can actually contribute to problem solving via the web. What most people don't realize is folks are making not only a living, but becoming millionaires by working this way. So there's a platform called the Top Coder platform, which is basically a few hundred thousand software developers, uh, algorithm folks, data scientists, um, folks that are really, really good at coding that are on this platform called TopCoder, and NASA has our own, um, our own area within TopCoder called the NASA Tournament Lab. And we post problems, uh, scientific, uh, scientific problems, coding problems, development problems, algorithm problems to this platform. 
And sometimes the prize is just $1,000 in a t-shirt and some top coder points to show how uh, awesome you are as a coder. Actually, many companies uh, recruit based on top coder score. Nowadays, too, they'll ask you for your top coder score to try to get a sense of how proficient a coder you are. But there are many people on the top coder platform that don't work for anybody other than themselves that are making over a million dollars a year. Just being really proficient at coding and showing that they're really good at that skill, right? They can use it to develop the skill, and then once they've got it, they are making bank, solving problems for a variety of different people that need their skill set, need their skill set, and don't necessarily have to go to the big company to get it. Go to Top Coder to get it. So what you're seeing playing in the background uh, is a video from our heliophysics program, which is basically the study of the sun. Um, uh, you may, I'll give you another example of a prize competition that, that, that we run at NASA. We run a variety of these challenges where we challenge non-traditional actors to solve important problems of science and technology. Uh, last year, uh, a couple years ago, we ran a challenge on the Innocentive platform. Uh, we have an area called the NASA Innovation Pavilion uh, that was trying to help us figure out better uh, how we could predict solar flares in advance. So what you're seeing on the video behind me is some beautiful footage from the um, Solar Dynamic Observatory, um, a telescope that we have that observes the sun um, from the year two of its operation. So you see a bunch of solar activity behind me as I'm talking. Well, these things you may or may not know. When the sun, a solar flare kind of pops up, a bunch of energy and radiation can, depending on where it happens on the sun, head straight towards the Earth. So this is where you see things like the northern lights, when this radiation and this energy is interacting with our magnetosphere. You see the beautiful lights in the northern part um, of the globe. Um, but this actually provides, presents a problem for our astronauts on the ISS. We are protected relatively here on the surface of the Earth by our atmosphere from these types of activities damaging us too much as people. But for those, uh, our astronauts that are on the International Space Station, they don't have that protection. So if we know is one is coming straight towards them, we have to have a sense of, you know, get them in their safe shelter on the ISS so that they're not just barraged with uh, space radiation. So we were looking for a better algorithm to predict solar flares in advance so we could better protect our astronauts on the ISS. Put out this challenge on Innocentive, and lo and behold, the solver, the guy that came up with a, a algorithm that predicted uh, solar flares eight hours in advance to an 85% accuracy, was a retired radio frequency engineer from New Hampshire, Bruce Cragen. He uh, had just retired to move to New Hampshire to be with his family, had some extra time on his hands, and in a previous life had actually worked some on uh, astrophysics, but had since gone and worked for a big telephone company and had worked on radio frequency stuff for the last 20 years of his career. For $20,000, he came up with a better algorithm that beat the state of the art. This is a guy that we never would have had an opportunity to work with through normal contracting or grant channels. We did a bunch of pilots that year in addition to the solar flare challenge. And out of the 3,000 people that participated in that, 95% said that they'd never worked with NASA, never had an opportunity, never knew how they would work with NASA. So prize competitions provide an opportunity for individuals to work with NASA on problems of space and technology. Another great example, uh, we don't just work on uh, algorithms and science and the things that you can do behind a computer, right? We're actually using prizes and challenges as well to get people to build stuff and bring it to demonstration events and show technology in action. So what you're seeing behind you is some footage from the Green Flight Challenge, which was a challenge that we ran a couple years ago um, that was seeking to uh, challenge organizations to build a four-seater general aviation aircraft that would fly 100 miles on the energy equivalent of a half a gallon of gas per person. That's really energy efficient, really energy efficient. There were two teams that were able to meet that goal, fly their plane, you see some footage of the planes flying behind me, fly their plane, beat that goal, and the winning team, Pipistrol, actually beat that by a factor of two. So they flew 200 miles uh, on the energy equivalent of a half a gallon of gas. These people were flying hardware for a $1.65 million potential prize purse. What we found um, in the after reports, kind of of this whole uh, challenge as well, was that the, the people that participated in the challenge invested over $6 million themselves in competing. So for $1.65 million of a prize purse that the taxpayer is paying for, now government agency, you see a 4x uh, leveraged investment by uh, the private sector in working towards these technology solutions. So those use competition, right? It's pulling on that competitive spirit to get people to participate in those prize competitions and make a living doing it. What if you were to pull on the collaborative, uh, driving towards the we, 
that we heard about earlier? What if you were to pull on those collaborative spirits of people? You guys may have heard about the International Space Apps Challenge that happened this last April around the world. 83 cities and 44 countries on every continent, including the ISS, hosted the International Space Apps Challenge, which was a two-day hackathon. We believe it's the largest hackathon in the galaxy ever <laughs> that we know of. <laughs> But nearly 9,000 people came physically together over these two days. And it ended up being something closer to 83 hours from when you start in Abu Dhabi and then you end at your last location. Um, 9,000 people physically came together in 83 locations. 2,500 people joined in remotely where there wasn't a physical location for them to go to. And they worked for, 20, for 48 hours for two days on solutions to over 50 NASA challenges that ranged from Mars exploration topics to um, Earth observation to the weather on Mars. Um, a variety of different challenge topics that people could work on in the areas of open hardware, open software, data visualization, or citizen science. And they submitted over 770 solutions to these problems over two days over a weekend. And the power here, this was all collaboration, right? There was no competition with this at all. People were coming together to learn from each other and bring their skills together and do things that were meaningful and spend their weekend getting inspired. I'm on a few of the Google groups that were out of the New York Space Apps Challenge, and that Google group is one of the most active Google groups I'm on, and it's been over for two months. These people just love to share and love to learn and are getting together over the weekends to continue their projects. So what does this say? These examples, and these are just a few of dozens of examples that NASA has as a large organization challenging DIYers, amateur, uh, amateur scientists, entrepreneurs to get involved in solving tough science and technology problems. What this says is that we believe all of you can also be rocket scientists, right? And that it takes sometimes a formal organization to open up channels and figure out how you actually capture the benefit from the chaos, right? The chaos is not necessarily a bad thing, and it's the way, in many ways, that work is changing and the way that work is evolving. So we can either be reactive to it, or you can think about how we can integrate it into the way that we do business at NASA. So there's a lot of these opportunities that are available today. You can check them out at the NASA Innovation Pavilion, the NASA Tournament Lab, Centennial Challenges Program. But we're inviting you. We want all of you that say, I have something to give. I have something to contribute. I want to learn. We're inviting you to do that with us. And we will pay you <laughs> for your solution, right, if you win. So I leave you with a question. How and why do you work? In this new, in this new world where skills are fluctuating, where I move between companies, where um, we're constantly innovating and taking in new information and jobs and careers are changing. How is it that you are working and are you ready for this new economy? Are you ready for this new way of working where not the big software development company is building the killer app for government, but a developer, a, a group of developers that are distributed around the world are beating that for a fraction of the cost for the government? Whatever motivates you, gold, guts, good, or glory, there can be many different reasons why you participate in these types of activities, why you're incentivized, whatever motivates you to do it. There are reasons and ways for you to get involved in really inspirational things that make every day, every moment, every hour of your limited time on this blue marble that we live on really inspirational and enabling you to help be the change that you want to see in the world. Thank you. <laughs>